Okay, so uh, before I start the uh, questions, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, whether we should make any changes uh, to this kind of retreat. Uh, what has, what kind of changes should we make? Do you think? Does anyone have any feelings for what has, uh, uh, what we can do to improve, or we can do anything better, or? Uh, Anything that is uh, whatever. Uh, do you have any opinions about that? It would be nice to hear people's opinions because we're always looking to make this kind of things. Even, even I have some ideas already, but I wanted to hear your ideas uh, first of all before I, before I blurt out my own ideas about this. Uh, <laughs> anyone have any opinions? Yes, please, Ange. Uh, can Ajahn come back more often? Because once per year is too few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, mm. Okay, no, uh, no comment to that one. <laughs> Let's see what happens there. Yeah, please, in the front here, uh, uh, Ange. Presentation from the floor here. <laughs> okay, that didn't, that didn't go down very well. Uh, you can, maybe you can have that at other times, yeah, when it might be better to do, to do that. Uh, um, anyone else want to say anything? Yeah. Ten minutes is better than five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes too short. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just about the center and then okay. Time what does people think? Ten minutes better or five minutes better? Yeah. Five, ten. <laughs> okay. How, how many people? Ten minutes. Oh, 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 okay. How many people? Five minutes. I, I think ten minutes is winning actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So ten minutes it is. Yeah. Maybe seven and a half minutes. <laughs> but middle way, middle way. But okay, but that's, that's a good point. So I, I actually had a similar thought myself. That's interesting, yeah. So, uh, please, sir. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I just wanted to say that I like this year's format on the short Q&A after each section. Mm. So that reduced the, the questions at the end of the day. Yeah. So that was very good. Uh, also, I just want to thank the, the Ajahn for coming. Uh, and the committee members, I think they did uh, an excellent job. Yeah, let's you do the thanking right? a little yeah. bit later. Okay. We we'll get All back right. to the thanking very soon. Thank yeah, you. yeah, that's, that's good. But, uh, but thank you for thanking. That's very, that's very. <laughs> it's a nice thing to do always. Uh. So yes, please. <laughs> yeah, maybe more um, contemplation practice. Contem what do you mean by that? Uh? Like uh, you, the other day you end in the on death, right? Yeah. Uh, you can. Uh, maybe the five contemplations. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So that is that. That will depend on the theme of the uh, of the course, right? Uh, and I, it's very. It, you're very welcome. And uh, anyone is very welcome to suggest themes uh, because I'm very open to really teach on any any kind of theme. So please feel free to suggest themes, and I'm sure Bobby will be very happy to to uh, receive your suggestions. Uh, and then we can use that as input, you know, for next year or whatever. If there is a next year, we don't know. If there is a next year, then we, we can use that for input. Uh, yeah. Very uncertain. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think the current focus on the Buddha and how he practices was a very good touch to let us be closer to him yeah. and I think perhaps similar themes in the future can be along this line uh, perhaps about you know him and and how he would have done it right uh, that yeah. would it actually is quite inspiring because yeah. uh, it gives us a lot of hope and a lot of uh, energy good, uh, good. Uh, yeah. that, that I yeah. just felt that it was a good uh, yeah. a good um, a good decision to, yeah. to to go on that way excellent okay yeah I, this was my thought I, I yeah. Okay. Good. Um, what about uh, what about Yen? Do you have any comments? Uh, no comment. Okay. No. The no comment comment. Okay. No comment comment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It is very rare to undertake any kind of a learning where one's teacher is improving. Mm -hmm. And I find that in Buddhism, the teacher is improving. 
Teeth was improving. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, Excellent. Sir. I'm yeah. not sure whether yeah. we can catch up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you, Wayne. I noticed that sometimes you left in the afternoon. Is the afternoon too long here? No, sir. I'm just not feeling well. So. Not feeling well. Okay. Because I'll, I'll go back and do. Because I one one of my suggestions, because I, I sometimes feel that maybe the afternoon can be too too long, yeah, too many hours, uh, and I was wondering uh, with Bobby whether we should uh, try to have three sessions in the morning instead of two, huh? and then have three in the afternoon. So you have six altogether now with the seven, huh? and then three in the afternoon, and then we can postpone lunch till twelve o'clock yeah, and have lunch from twelve instead. Huh? Well, is that a good idea? Huh? Because I think in the morning people are also more awake and more kind of clear. And, and I, I notice with myself in the morning I usually have, you know, sometimes more energy. Yeah. And uh, what do people think of that idea? Is that a good idea? Yeah? 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 Okay, great. Okay, good. So we will uh, do that. And then the other thing about that, Bobby, is that if we do have only three sessions in the afternoon, then we can, if you want to have a public talk in the evening, one or two days, you can do that as well, you know, yeah. if that is a good idea. Yeah. But it, I know you have asked about that in the past, uh, and we could uh, do something like that. We can even have meditation in the evening, yeah, together. M meditation in the morning and then in the evening, so that sort of thing, yeah. yeah. Dear Ajahn, um, one, one thought I have is, because after listening to the teachings of the Sutta, mm. you know, sometimes it's good to sit down, sing in, and really, you know, absorb. So, yeah. Um, after the five days retreat, so I was thinking maybe in the future we can add like a one day retreat after the sutta, or it could be after two days sutta, one day retreat, then after two days sutta back yeah. again. Yeah. So at least we have a time and space, yeah. you know, to absorb and. Yeah. Or it could be like an evening sitting, which will be helpful as well for some of us who yeah. like to sit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right, so let's get on to the questions then, maybe. Can we can have a look at the, uh, the written questions. And as we go along, please feel free to, uh, uh, to kind of comment on these things, if you wish, as we go along here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? So, dear Ajahn, during meditation, while the pain is constant and real, can the contemplation of pain be converted to sensations, i.e. looking at pain in another way, so one no longer feels pain? Uh, it may be possible to do that, uh, especially if you have strong mindfulness, you may be able to kind of just see it as sensations without feeling the pain. If you're able to do that, uh, please do so, that's fine. Uh, and then you can go back to the breath when the sensation and it won't be a hindrance. Uh, but remember, the point here is really to use the breath to achieve samadhi. That's kind of the point of all of this. Uh, and so you want, don't want to have things getting in the way of samadhi practice. That's the main issue here. Uh. So whatever works, so you can come back to the breath, and you can actually attain some uh, focus on the breath. That is really what you want to uh, get to in the end. Uh. Okay, dear Arjan, this morning uh, you read a sutta about the Buddha's encounter with devas. I would like to share some stories with you. Okay, yay, stories. Okay, great. <laughs> Many years ago, my family owned a fierce dog that barked a lot. Uh, the dog kennel was situated near my neighbor's small traditional shrine. My neighbor prayed to a local guardian deity, commonly known as Na Tukong in Malay Singapore. Na Tukong? You know? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Na Tukong. Okay. One day, my mother noticed the dog was chained to the other side of the house. My mother asked my father if he actually had done that. He said it wasn't his doing. My mother moved the dog back to its kennel. The next day, the dog was chained to the other side of the house again. In Asia, there are many traditional temples that offer spirit medium services. It's a way devas use a human body as a vehicle to communicate with human beings, assuming they are genuine. My parents visited a temple, the deva said the local guardian deity was annoyed with the constant barking, so he moved the dog to the other side of the house. My father relocated the kennel, and all was well. <laughs> That's really cool, isn't it? <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Thank you for that. 
P.S. My father could have pranked my mother. If so, it would have been hilarious, but I don't think he did. <laughs> Another story was my grandmother's personal experience. She owned a factory with many foreign workers. One day, she noticed her staff's medical cost was rising. Her workers were injured from falling way too frequently. She felt odd and strange. She too visited a temple. The deva said that the local guardian deity that she prayed to was angry at her workers for holding sex parties at midnight frequently. So they were punished by the deity. My grandmother interrogated her workers and they admitted hiring prostitutes frequently at the living quarters of my grandmother's factory. They apologized to the deity by offering incense and all was well there. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, thank you for those uh, uh, nice stories, uh, because, uh, um, yeah, I mean, there are many things happening in the world, uh, and many things that very often, because uh, many of these things are not really accepted in contemporary society, people keep it quiet. They don't dare to talk about things. Uh, but once you start talking about these things, you find that there are so many people who have these kind of experiences, or similar experiences. Uh, such a common thing in the world. Uh, so it's nice to talk about because it allows everyone a chance to open up and to actually talk about this particular uh, this, uh, interesting incident. So. so thank you very much for that. Okay, dear Ajahn, Namo Buddhaya. Namo Buddhaya means like uh, homage to the Buddha. Thank you for your teaching. It has really made me feel closer to the Buddha and much more at ease and eager with the practice. That is a wonderful thing. Uh, I do have a few questions. Number one, it's not 14, there's only two this time. <laughs> Is there any sutta on self-compassion, as I find it hard to practice this particular part? Uh, there is no sutta on self-compassion, but compassion for oneself is exactly the same thing as compassion for others. Uh, the same ideas that actually are valid. Uh, and uh, the idea, the reason you find it hard to have self-compassion is because you think that you are responsible. Uh, yeah, you think that you are responsible for your life, and if you suffer, it is your fault, and it is not, you know, you, you have the power to do better or whatever, so you can't really have self compassion. Uh, but start to realize that actually, uh, most of the time, we have no control of our lives. So many of the things that we have to experience are external things that influence us one way or another. Uh, also, you are in trapped by your habits. Yeah? Your habits that you have built up over lifetimes, these are the things that trap you. Huh? And because they trap you, huh, it is basically uh, impossible for you to do anything other than what you are doing. You are trapped by your own habits. Huh? Have compassion for yourself for being trapped in those habits. Huh? It's like a program, like a robot uh, running on a program that was written deep in the past, uh, many, many centuries ago thousands of years ago, lifetimes ago, and now you are the robot that has to act out that program because of what you did in the past. And you have no choice. You have to run on that program. And sometimes it's very strange. I have seen with myself how over time you kind of you start to come out of your conditioning. And then you look back on the person you were, maybe a long time ago, and you start to realize how trapped you were. I look back to myself before I became a monk, and I see that person, at the time I thought I was in charge of myself, but now looking back I realize I was completely trapped by that conditioning. I couldn't really be any other person. And then you elevate your mind out of that and you start to realize only then do you really understand the trap that you were in. So try to see more clearly that you are trapped. Yeah, You don't really have any choice. You are very deserving of compassion precisely because you are in this trap your own inner trap and also the trap of the society around you. Huh? The more you see that, uh, the more easy it is to have compassion not for yourself, not just for yourself, but also for other people as well, because we're all trapped in this particular way. Huh? Then compassion becomes possible. Huh? So please be compassionate for yourself, uh, yeah? because uh, it is, um, I think, a fundamental and important aspect of uh, understanding compassion. If you can have compassion for others, you will also have it for yourself. If you can have it for yourself, you will also for have it for others. Because it is a universal view of humanity. And because we're all humans, we all receive the same compassion as a consequence. 
Number two, some people use meditation as an escape from painful feelings, avoiding it uh, and not processing it. Uh, how do we identify if it is avoidance? Sukhi uh, Hotu Um It is okay. Some degree of avoidance is all right. Yeah? There's no point in wallowing in negative feelings. Uh, there's no point in exaggerating the negative feelings in the world. If we can enjoy some happiness in meditation, please do it. Uh, but of course, there is also true at the same time that there are negative things in our life that we should deal with, uh, because there are problems that unless we deal with them, uh, they're going to kind of be lurking in the background. Uh. But sometimes if you use meditation to strengthen your mind, uh, to have some happiness, to have some equanimity, it should help you to deal with those problems in life. Uh. So use meditation as an aid to deal with problems. Uh. And then once you resolve those problems, uh, then the chances are your meditation will go even deeper as a consequence. So a little bit of avoidance is okay because that's kind of the part of the purpose of meditation, but also there are some problems that we have to deal with. So try to deal with them in this particular way here. Um, you have to find that right balance for yourself. All right, next one. Dear Ajahn Brahmali, uh, with deep gratitude, we thank you very much for your profound teachings and guidance for all of us. Uh, please advise on the light and vision experience sometimes during practice. Uh, one, I see movement of one color or two colors, green, yellow, uh, and yellow and purple. Two, I see a small bright light like coming out from a tunnel. Uh, three, see the red blood flowing continuously inside the vein, moving in one direction. Shall I continue looking when any of these occur, or just go back to observing the breath? Thank you. If you see a small bright light, that sounds like the, the right one. This is the kind of the one you want, uh, because a small bright light is something that hopefully is still, if it's coming out from a tunnel, that seems to be the right one to me. The other ones, the movement and the blood flowing in the veins, is probably too much movement. And if it's too much movement, it's going to be uh, problematic. It will not probably give rise to the kind of thing that you want. Then go back to the breath. If it's a small bright light, see if you can focus on it. Uh, if you find it hard to focus on for whatever reason, uh, then uh, go back to the breath. Make it more bright, more powerful, uh, and then there will be an outcome as a consequence. Uh, yeah. So try, and you will from trial and error, uh, you will start to understand how these things actually work. Uh, that is often the, uh, the kind of the bottom line. We have to try a little bit ourselves. You cannot, uh, you learn the most uh, by trial and uh, you learn less from uh, what other people can tell you. Dear Ajahn, in one of the suttas the Buddha said that the Dhamma Buddha Sasana period would be shortened because women were ordained as bhikkhunis. Uh, was this a late addition to the suttas? Uh, thank you. Um, it is uh, uncertain. I think some people have argued that this is a later addition, that it wasn't really part of it, that maybe it was part of the uh, kind of Indian uh, social context at the time. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I find it kind of strange that the Buddha agrees to ordain women, and then the first thing he says is that now the sasana will be shortened. It sounds like he's undermining his own decision just before. Uh, you decide and then straight away you say it's going to be bad. It, it sounds weird. To me it doesn't really rhyme, and I, I find it very hard to see why the Buddha would do that. It sounds like he's kind of, uh, yeah, it sounds strange. I must admit, I, I prefer the theory that this is a later edition and the Buddha never actually said that. Uh, Remember also that the Buddha said when he met Mara in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, he said that uh, he would not be satisfied with his uh, sasana until the four assemblies were established. Bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen, laywomen. All the four assemblies should be established, they should be strong, they should know how to teach the Dhamma, how to refute the doctrines of others. So in other words, very strong assemblies. And because he says that there, the feeling is that this was his idea all along to have a bhikkhuni sangha. So why then would you undermine that by saying these things? And that's only one of the, there's a large number of similes there which seems to point to the fact that having 
women renunciant somehow is going to be negative. So I have my, I have my doubts. And uh, it's very hard to come to any final conclusion, but to me it does not seem genuine, to be honest. Dear Ajahn, this is the first time in joining the Sutta Retreat in person. I would like to thank Ajahn for the guidance of the Sutta study and meditation. I learned a great deal from your lessons and from the past few days. Overall, it is a very fruitful retreat. Moving forward, what is my next step in furthering my Sutta study in order to enhance my knowledge and understanding here? My deepest gratitude to Ajahn Brahmali. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So the next step is to... Uh, uh, maybe try to read some suttas on your own. Uh, uh, take a book like the In the Buddha's Words. In the Buddha's Words uh, is a nice compilation of suttas. Uh, try to read that. Uh, there are also uh, there is a sutta studies done on that book. If you go online and you so search, I think Pante Sujato actually did a sutta study on that entire book. Yeah. And so you can actually read that book with a commentary from a monk who knows what he's talking about. Bhante Sujato is one of these monks who is very learned in the suttas, and he has in fact translated all the suttas. So he is one of the, I think the only person probably, existing person, who actually one person translated all the suttas. He's the only one in the world who has done that. That's pretty awesome. Uh, he has a big head, has a big brain inside, and so he <laughs> translates away. <laughs> and so try... Try that, uh, yeah, read those uh, in the Buddha's words, uh, and then use the aid of uh, people online who explain these suttas, and then gradually you will start to learn how to understand them in the right way. Uh, and uh, yeah, something like that, yeah, and carry on gradually, and then you, uh, whenever there is a nice teacher in town here in KL, and go and listen to some nice talks, and you, you go further on the path. Uh. Dear Ajahn, uh, we are all were all the previous Sammas, were all the previous Sam, Sammas born in India. Is the future Sammasambuddha to be born in India as well? Why is that so? Any possibility at least of one Sammasambuddha being born in the West? Sikkihot, <laughs> we were happy. Like in the West, yeah. But what about in Malaysia? Being born in Malaysia, that would be interesting. Yeah. So, um, why is he born in India? And that seems to be the case that uh, the Buddha is always said to be born in Jambudipa. And Jambudipa is the rose apple land. And it's basically a name for India. So why is that? And I would say that uh, the point is that wherever the Buddha is born, that is called India. <laughs> that is my understanding of that, right? And because uh, I think the point... The point is that um, for a Buddha to arise in a particular society, that society will have to have certain characteristics. Uh, and those characteristics would be similar to the characteristics that they had in ancient India. What do I mean by that? It will have to be a society that values ascetics and samanas, right? Uh, so that they can actually live the ascetic lifestyle. Uh, they can be supported by arms, right? Uh, India had that kind of society where ascetics would actually were valued and that's why it was possible to be an ascetic there. Most of the rest of the world it wouldn't be possible because they didn't value the idea of asceticism. Second condition was that it, they already had ascetics who were well, well developed in the practice, who already had samadhi. So a large part of the path was already laid out and ready for them. Yeah, the Buddha could go all the way to the jhanas and he only had this final last thing to do, the insight, to go all the way to the end. So these are some of the characteristics of India that make India a useful place. So I think any country that has those characteristics, that country is called India. That's my guess. <laughs> so yeah, it could be anywhere, basically. That's what I reckon. Please. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. So it kind of is weird, isn't it? Because the, the Earth doesn't exist. So what is India if it's a different universe? It kind of the whole thing is very difficult. So that's why I think it's better to interpret is that whatever the Buddha is born, that is called India. That kind of gets rid of the problem. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. So indeed, yeah. But uh, yeah. All right. Let's a uh, few more questions uh, at the very end here. Sukihoto Ajahn, you are a great salesman of Buddhism. Okay, I'm very happy to hear that because that is my goal, eh, to be the salesman of Buddhism. Eh? I once heard Ajahn mention that not everything is determined by Kamma, uh, otherwise there will be no escape from Sangsara. That's exactly right. That's what the Buddha says in the suttas. Eh? I'm not quite sure why there is no escape from Sangsara if everything is determined by Kamma. Which sutta describes that statement? Uh, can Ajahn kindly explain the logic behind it? Uh, Thank you for the sutra, please. Please come back more often. Okay. Um, it is found in one sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya 3, number 61. Let's just bring it up so you can see it, so you, do, you know that I'm not kind of telling you dodgy, dodgy things. <laughs> so uh, let's see here. Sutta Central, uh, Basket of Discourses. This is the website, by the way, the Sutta Central website, uh, where, where all the, uh, the suttas are found. Uh, and uh, the Book of Threes, uh, the second fifty, uh, and then we have the Great Chapter, and we have the Sectarian Tenets, translated by Bhikkhu Sujato, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Which one shall we choose? Uh, let's go Bhikkhu Sujato. Uh, he's my friend. So, uh, <laughs> so um, here we are, right? Uh, so this is the sentence right there. Uh, first of all, Let's start from the beginning. Mendicants, these three sectarian tenets, tenets is like doctrines, uh, as pursued, pressed, and grilled by the astute, when taken to the conclusion, end with inaction. In other words, it means that if you follow these doctrines, then there's no point in doing anything. Uh, yeah, you just kind of chill, you don't do anything, any practice. And this is the first one. Everything this individual experiences, pleasure, pain, or neutral, is because of past deeds. This is the idea that kamma is the cause of everything. Yeah? If that is what you believe, then there is no action that can be done. And the reason for that is because what that, what that seems to mean is that uh, uh, whatever you do in the here and now is determined by your past actions. Yes, so in other words, you, you, are, you are trapped, even your will, even your, everything you do is trapped by the actions of the past. Uh, so everything is determined by past actions. Uh, so in other words, there's no ability to, to uh, come out of this uh, trap because the past controls everything. Uh, so you have to have the ability of the will, uh, the intention, uh, to somehow not be subject to the karma of the past. Uh, yeah, this is the idea. The will, you have to be able to will independently of the past karma. If your will is determined by past karma, there is no escape. That's kind of the idea behind this, uh, as I understand it. Yeah. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, a few more questions. Sukihoto Ajahn, many thanks for your guidance. Uh, the constriction in my chest dissipated this morning. Yay, well done. Bless you, and may you be well always. Recognizing impermanence, may it not recur. <laughs> Good. But then it, it may recur, right? So, yeah, so, yeah you have, you're right. Anyway, see what happens. Ajahn, regarding the practice of Anapanasati, most teachers say to focus on the area below the nostrils. It is the only spot to notice the breath. What does the sutta say? Thank you again, Ajahn. Remember, this is the commentarial interpretation, and that is why this... Most people say that because most teachers follow the commentaries. Uh, and it is not wrong. It is not wrong thing, but I think for most people it is more relaxing just to be aware of the breath in general. And I have always followed this teaching. This is how Ajahn Brahm always taught. Uh, and I have found it more relaxing because it's not so constricted in the way you focus. Uh, breathing in, breathing out. Just a general awareness of the breath. Uh, so that is what I would recommend. Uh, uh, of course, when your attention becomes very sharp, your mindfulness very sharp, then it is actually much easier to focus on a very small area, and then you can maybe do that. Uh, 
Attending a physical retreat with you is so joyful and engaging versus a Zoom retreat. Please come back more often for Sutta Reads. Much better. It is true, and I must admit that I also prefer to do the live retreats rather than the Zoom ones. The Zoom one, the audience is far away. It is, you don't feel that you engage quite in the same way. So it actually is very nice to be back in person again. But sometimes you need that dukkha of Zoom to really enjoy yeah, the happiness of in person later on. So maybe we should be grateful for the Zoom dukkha. And then, uh, <laughs> anyway. Dear Ajahn, my sincere gratitude, Ajahn, for all your hard work in preparing and delivering the Dhamma. My question is, where should we, one aspire to take rebirth in, as in which realm, if we want to, uh, to cultivate till liberation, the fi final liberation? I would recommend not to really aspire for anything at all. I would recommend just to allow Kamma to take its root, uh, because... Uh, if we aspire too much and we try to control things like rebirth, uh, usually we end up messing it up. Uh, yeah? Because we don't really know what we're doing. Yeah? We're kind of trying very hard, trying to put our mind in a certain direction. Uh, just allow Kamma to take its course. And the Kamma will take you probably to the best location for you. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, try to avoid the lower realms, though. That's kind of what you want to avoid, uh, because that's going to be very problematic for you. Uh, otherwise, uh, the lower Deva realms or the human realms are all realms where the Dhamma is available, huh? and so you should be able to continue your practice there. Yeah. Last question for today. Yeah, this is a very good. Oh, sorry, not the last. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Gee, another multi, multi, multi question. Okay, anyway. So let's see uh, what. Eight questions on one sheet. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let's see what happens. It may it may not be too difficult. So let's see. Uh, in the Buddha's time, there were a lot of arahants. Ah, oh, it's more like point by point. Okay, it's not not questions really. Good. There were lots of arahants, anagamas, etc. In the present day, there are few, if any, arahants at all. I am speculating that in the Buddha's time, they have the benefit of having Samma Sambuddhas as their teacher. However, nowadays we can only study and learn the Dhamma through Nikayas and interpretation by our teacher. These dodgy teachers, right? Never know whether <laughs> interpretation is right or not. <laughs> the problem is that the Nikayas were passed down through verbal tradition and later in written form through a long series of communication channels and through a long time period. Communication errors are bound to happen as there are no error correction mechanism. Actually, there is a reconnection mechanism. But anyway, on top of that, it was written in Pali and uh, later translated into English. Accuracy of the translation is a problem. So nowadays, we're not sure if the English translation uh, version is done properly. I hope in the future, with the advancement of AI, we will have more reliable version of the Nikayas. Um, I am not sure if I would trust AI to, to do the, uh, the translation of the Nikayas. Uh, um, what? The AI has to restream it first, okay. Uh, but I, I, would, I would say that um, it is surprising how accurately these suttas have been kept over two and a half thousand years. Yes, there are some errors in there. But it's fascinating because when you compare the, the translations into Chinese, uh, compare it with the Pali, it's sometimes extraordinary how similar it is, even though they have been separated for 2,300 years. Uh, and so you know that the tradition has actually been very effective, very conservative and very effective in keeping the suttas in the right way. It's, it's really extraordinary. For example, sequences like dependent liberation, if you compare them next to each other, and I have done this because I have access to both the Chinese and the Pali, they are word for word, verbatim the same, yeah? going down. That's extraordinary. First and, ja first and second jhana formulas, verbatim the same in the Chinese and the Pali. So um, there is a lot of things that have been kept uh, almost exactly the same for a very, very long period. Uh, and so you don't need to be too concerned. Uh, some of the modern translations that you find, like Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, Bhante Sujato's translations too, are actually very accurate. Uh, yeah? And uh, when you come to a sutta retreat like this, we have the opportunity to discuss some of these points. Uh, 
I can read the Pali. I've been translating a thousand, over a thousand pages of Pali myself, the whole Vinaya Pitaka. So uh, I have a good understanding of the Pali. Uh, so we can then have a discussion about these issues, and it gives an opportunity to go deeper into the suttas. Uh, so I would say that don't despair. I say the Dhamma, to me, the Dhamma is still alive today. Uh, there's still people in the world who experience these teachings who don't understand what they are about. Uh, so there's every reason to rejoice that we still have the Dhamma. Don't wait. Don't uh, think that when AI comes, everything will be sorted out. Yeah? AI, new problems will arise. And especially the AI we have now is apparently a bit dodgy. Everyone is kind of raving about the chat GPT, or whatever it's called. But actually, it turns out to be really dodgy. Yeah, they, whatever you put in, you get out what other people have basically said before. It just takes the existing corpus that we have of books or whatever, and it digests it and spits out something. And whatever it is, it's going to be as bad. I, I've recently heard some examples of what comes out of these things, and it's not that impressive, right? So uh, AI may, you know, I don't know about AI. So anyway, so <laughs> sometimes I think the uh, non-artificial intelligence is better than the artificial one. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, especially the most important thing in the world is to have the noble ones to teach you. So uh, I would say look out for the good teachers. Uh, there are still very inspiring teachers available in the world. Uh, look out for them, uh, listen to them, uh, and when you listen to those very inspiring teachers, and often they are very simple in the way they teach, uh, often they are very kind of, uh, look for the real Dhamma qualities in people, and when you find those and you see those, uh, then listen carefully, and then there's a chance, I think, you will be able to grow a lot in the Dhamma in this life. Uh, no need to wait for the next Buddha, no need to wait for the next AI, uh, no need to wait for anything at all. Just get on with it right now. <laughs> okay, everyone, so we have now coming towards the very end. I just take uh, two minutes just to summarize what I have been saying throughout the last five days. And it's very thing that I always like to summarize at the end of every, ret every retreat uh, is just to remind you what really matters. Uh, five days of Dhamma is a lot, uh, so how can we distill this Dhamma into something that you can remember, right? Uh, so how much can you remember? Uh, how many things, how many things should I tell you? So how many can you remember? Uh, eight, eight, uh, relax, uh, okay. We can't, okay, but how, how many, because I'm gonna, I have to decide how many things to tell you, right? So how many things can you remember? Uh, all? So, okay, I will, I will make it really simple for you. I'll tell you one word, right? Uh, to make, I, how many things, I know that even one word is very difficult. I'll tell you one word to remember. Uh, anything more than one word, and it's gonna get, and it's gonna get, get lost. Even if I tell you one word, are you gonna remember the one word? Uh, wrong. You're going to forget it. I guarantee you. I guarantee you're going to forget it. Because in our busy life, when we get around doing things, everything goes out the window, right? You even forget the one word. But there's one thing you need to remember, one thing you need to do. And if you can remember this word, lodge that in the back of your mind, keep it with you as much as you possibly can, then you're going to go a long way on this path. One thing is Exactly. You know it already, right? Uh, I'm just going to reinforce it. Remember kindness, sir. If you can do everything in your life with kindness, your actions, your speech, your thoughts, your perceptions, everything, your intentions, uh, you are going to go a long, long way on this path. Uh, to be able to remember kindness, uh, remember that when you need some inspiration, uh, when you need some Dhamma in your life, come back to these teachings. Uh, get a top-up. Uh, get a top-up from someone you respect, uh, someone you feel teaches the real teachings, go directly to the suttas, if that inspire you, go directly to the word of the Buddha, or listen to someone you feel teaches in accordance with his teachings. Uh, always remember to get top-ups. Uh, you're going to need those top-ups until you become an arahant, right? Uh, to keep you inspired on this path. Uh, so that is really all you need. Remember kindness, uh, and then remember that the commitment and the perseverance on this path comes from finding the inspiration in the word of the Buddha. Yeah? So come back to these teachings regularly. Then you're going to be in the right track. Yeah? Then you're going to be heading in the right direction towards Nibbana itself. Yeah? So that is my last advice to you on this retreat. So.
<laughs> okay, wonderful. So, uh, um, what now, Bobby? Uh, should I speak? Are you going to speak, or should I should, should I say something more, or should I shut up now? Or yeah. <laughs> okay. So I so you, you want to do that? Should I? Yeah. You, okay. No, 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 okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, this uh, send him, this uh, workshop would have not have been possible without the assistance of uh, our team of volunteers. Uh, so I'd like to recognize them. Can you please stand up when your uh, name is read out? Jennifer Wong for registration. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Our floor manager, Brother Lai, like Kim Lui. Yay. And uh, your lunches from Siu Ling. <laughs> and the wonderful tea breaks from Sister Siu Lian and Linda Ong. Right at the back. Kapias and uh, audiovisuals, Brother Ang and myself. <laughs> breakfast team, I just was commenting a wonderful breakfast. <laughs> Sister <laughs> Elaine. Yeah. Sister Wayne. Chui Huang. <laughs> and uh, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> and our treasurer, Sister Karen. Ng. Okay, thank you. So, what do you actually? Okay, no, that's wonderful. So, thank you so much for organizing this because there's a lot of hard work behind this workshop. So, thank you everyone for your wonderful work. And thank you also, Venerable Punsiri, for coming. It's nice to have another monastic coming as well. And, yeah. And thanks everyone for coming on the retreat. If you hadn't come, it wouldn't be the same. Yeah? <laughs> so, wonderful. Yeah, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, uh, okay, that's it, Bobby. Is that it? Yeah, so what do we do now? We just go back? <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. Okay, Tra okay. transcends of merits. Sh sharing of merits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do the sharing of the merits. And uh, so, uh, this is a nice way of always ending a retreat, sharing the merits. So, we're going to do this the traditional Sri Lankan way of sharing the merits. And so please keep in mind your relatives, your departed people, as you do this, all the goodness that we have done during the last few days, we share it with everyone here. Yeah. <laughs> E dang me nyate nang ho tu Suke ta hon tu nyata yon Tu sadu sadu We should also pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha before we go Bobby That's an important one yeah So let's uh, let's do that do that now <coughs> okay. Arahang Sama Sambuddho Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhivademi Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo Tamang namasami Supati panno bhagavato savaka sango sangang namami